Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip. Yeah, this is the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. We've been going for over five years now, bringing some theological ingredients for you to brew your own faith. Over five years, that means there are episodes, little audiological ingredients for you to do some thinking um, that, that have been in storage for a while. You could say they're barrel aged. And today I'm bringing out a new barrel. This is John Caputo's first visit to the podcast, the deconstructive philosopher extraordinaire, uh, the interpreter of Jacques Derrida, a uh, member of the uh, Homebrew Christianity Trinity of JCs. That would be Jesus Christ, John Cobb, Faniac, Faniac, and Jack Caputo. That's right, our favorite deconstructor. Yo! Jokes, jokes, jokes. Anyway, this is my very first conversation with him over five years ago, and it's coming out of the barrels for you. You'll notice a couple things. One, I have not convinced Jack that he should be friends with me yet. Uh, so this is a, a good example of how Trip kisses intellectual butt. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Free, free for you, right there. Mm-hmm. And then uh, most you'll notice that uh, my southern accent is quite a bit thicker, I think. And uh, I sound younger, because I was. I was like five years ago. The other thing you'll notice is that in this first conversation, Caputo pulls back a way of understanding Derrida that I did not see coming. Yeah. And he uses Kierkegaard to do it. So just, if you're a nerd, just know that's coming. Uh, Last but not least, Homebrewed Christianity Deacons, Jack Caputo has a new book out, The Insistence of God. You should go get it. You should get it by clicking through the Amazon link on Homebrewed Christianity. You should also check out the blogosphere. Because there's a blog tour going on about Jack Caputo's book, The Insistence of God. So I insist you check out that insistence. Oh, yeah. And um, thanks for listening. Thanks for checking us out. Go to homebrewedchristianity.com. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes. When you do subscribe on iTunes, um, uh, leave us a review. Five stars. Even if you hate us. Put five stars there because grace. And then say horrible things in your actual review, but just give us five stars. It helps spread the word, you know? Make sure you subscribe to Theology Nerd Throwdown, too, because uh, that's where Bo and I uh, get to holler back at you. Was that rhymed? Yeah. That makes it religious. Um, So, Jack Caputo, the hermeneutics, a radical hermeneutics, to the weakness of God. He tells that philosophical story of his. I got there, right? Radical hermeneutics, all the way to doing the weakness of God. That's where I ran into Jack for the first time because it started sounding a little process. And I said, oh, I'm going to talk to this guy. I got to figure it out. Yep. Now you can figure it out, too. Uh, ready to nerd out with your geek out with Jack Caputo? Oh, good, because you're about to. Peace. Christianity listeners, this is Trip, and I am here with Dr. John Caputo, and we will be having a little conversation today about his journey from radical hermeneutics to the weakness of God. Um, well, I'm glad you're here, Dr. Caputo. I'm very glad to be here, Trip. I was thinking we could begin with you just giving um, a little brief biography about yourself and how you ended up being a philosopher to begin with. Well, uh, my my uh, story actually started uh, in th- in theology uh, because my my the very f- first really important decision I made in life was uh, to enter a Catholic religious order back in uh, the late 1950s after I graduated high school. So I spent four years uh, in uh, an order called the Christian Brothers or the Brothers of the Christian Schools. And wherever, wherever you see a LaSalle University or college or high school, that will be a Christian Brothers outfit. And I, was, I remember the order was founded by Jean-Baptiste de LaSalle. And so I spent... Uh, a fairly intense period, uh, particularly the first 15 months in the novitiate, where we, we really kept uh, a monastic regime, you know, with silence and prayer and work. And, you know, it might, might have been, but for a few modern conveniences, it might have been uh, the Middle Ages. 
and uh, it was the Catholicism before Vatican II. And uh, so I, I uh, was deeply immersed in questions of, uh, of my own Catholic uh, heritage and uh, deeply immersed in theology. Um, and in the course of uh, pursuing these theological questions, I began to discover more and more, and this is particularly true in the Catholic tradition, um, the philosophical uh, underpinnings and the implicit philosophical questions. So I finally uh, barrowed my way through a series of theological issues into um, philosophy itself. And um, then when I, uh, after I left the order, uh, I pursued uh, my PhD in philosophy. But um, those four years right after high school uh, were deeply formative. You know, I never, never shook them. And uh, so they always, no matter how philosophical uh, the questions I pursued were, I was always... Uh, uh, I always had theological issues in the back of my head. Mm -hmm. So I, I went on from, uh, after I left the religious, I went to graduate school and I got a PhD in philosophy. And then you can, and started teaching philosophy. And then and you could see right off the bat that I was um, sort of hovering in the space between philosophy and theology because the very first books I wrote were about Heidegger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so your, your, the title of your discussion today is from Radical Hermeneutics, but before Radical Hermeneutics, there were two books on Heidegger, uh, both of which pursued the question of Heidegger's relationship to the Middle Ages, which is where I started working in philosophy, because as a Catholic, and particularly in, in the 1960s, um, I was up to my ears in medieval philosophy and Thomas Aquinas. In fact, I came within have a hair of going to Toronto and work and studying as a medievalist. You know, my initial interests weren't at all in contemporary philosophy uh, in, the, in the very beginning. But um, they, they shifted to contemporary philosophy. Um, and then my, the very first projects I had as a, as a philosopher were, were to examine the, the interplay between Heidegger, who was the one who most uh, uh, fascinated me philosophically in, in initially, because my, my initial interest in, in contemporary philosophy was Heidegger, um, the relationship between Heidegger and the Middle Ages. First, uh, uh, with uh, Meister Eckhart, who was very, very important for Heidegger, um, the mysticism of what Meister Eckhart was uh, a model for for Heidegger later on in his life when he started to the, after the so-called turn, mm -hmm. and then after that I wrote a book on Heidegger and Thomas Aquinas uh, because there was this long-standing question in Thomas Aquinas about the question of being, uh, which is actually how I got interested in Heidegger. In Thomas Aquinas, the all the emphasis is on what Thomas called in Latin essay to be being. And uh, there was this uh, strong line of interpretation of Thomas Aquinas as the philosopher of essay, of being. And uh, that's what drew my attention to Heidegger, because the same people were saying the same thing about Heidegger. So there was a second book to be written, not just about Heidegger and medieval mysticism, but Heidegger and the philosophy of being uh, in Thomas Aquinas, and, and that meant the question of whether the philosophy of being in Thomas Aquinas belonged to what Heidegger called metaphysics or ontotheology, or whether it was, in Heidegger's terms, a genuine thought of being, so what Heidegger called design thinking. So right out of the starting gate, right from the very beginning, I was tackling philosophical questions that were um, had a theological horizon. How would you differentiate um, philosophy and theology for um, a general audience? And maybe uh, 
give us, uh, for the person who may not know much about Heidegger, just a little bit about him and maybe how he influences people on both streams? Well, um, I think the difference, one difference between philosophy and theology is you might say the question of authority. Derrida at one point says about philosophy, although he also says the same thing about literature, so he can only get so far with this, but he says, philosophy is the right to ask any question, and implicitly to um, the freedom to, to say whatever's on your mind by way of an answer. Whereas in theology, there's always an authority. Somewhere along the line, you have you have a you may call a conversation stopper. Mm-hmm. Someone will say, "Well, look, if you're going to question that, then why are you even a X?" So, for example, if someone questions the divinity of Jesus, you say, "Well, why are you even a Christian?" That that is Christianity. There there is a certain kind of authoritative voice that says. A Christian subscribes, holds, affirms certain things, and these are definitive and authoritative within the tradition. This is this is what this is the very meaning of the tradition. This is the authority of the tradition. This is the authority of the church. Uh, this is the authority of the scripture. So you have at a certain point an authoritative voice which stops the conversation and draws the line and uh, says this is as far as as you can go or as one can go. Um, Whereas in philosophy there is simply um, there's nothing there's nothing exactly like that. There is something a little bit like that and that is the the authority of the, the, the command, the, the necessity to make sense, you know, to speak clearly, to to have a reason for what you're saying, to uh, to be able to explain yourself and and, and deal with uh, obvious objections to what you're saying. So there, you might say, well, there's the authority of of having to make sense or the, the demand to make sense, but beyond that, there's no hold or barred. Um, now. I myself say, well, okay, and for a long time I observed that distinction because that's roughly like the distinction between faith and reason. Um, I I myself uh, have come to refine that a bit and to make a distinction between strong theology and weak theology, um, which is, you can see that, that going on in the weakness of God, where... Uh, the strong theology means confessional theology, and so that's the theology we've been talking about right now, where there is a strong or authoritarian uh, or dogmatic voice which says, uh, which holds to uh, very determinate uh, doctrines and teachings and um, con- confessional lines. So strong theology, confessional theology. But um, there is another possibility for theology, which I find um, in some ways even more interesting. Although you know, I would never lose my interest in the confessional theologies, and and that's weak theology, where theology, which after all is a word that simply means uh, the logos, what we have to say and to think about God. There's a, a weak theology, which is um, not bound by these confessional uh, demands, and which doesn't uh, recognize some kind of confessional authority, which allows us the uh, or which which uh, forbids us from trespassing beyond certain doctrinal limits. Um, but which, in the in the spirit of, of philosophy, thinks um, thinks through what's going on in theology. And so, uh, I myself will make a distinction between 
say, the name of God and the event that's going on in the name of God. That is mm-hmm. to say, what's, what's happening there without getting caught up in uh, a, a um, dogmatics, you know, without getting caught up in, in confessional authority. Um, and um, that's, that's a little bit, no, it's not a little bit, it, it, it's like the distinction that Derrida makes between faith and belief where belief means believing in things like the Trinity or the Incarnation um, or the, uh, the flight from Egypt and the story of Moses and uh, the, the specific uh, uh, beliefs that are, you find in, in, in given individual uh, religious traditions. Where faith, on the other hand, is um, a more... Um, radical uh, act of affirming the future, but without sort of, you know, without all the the, the determinate um, supports of, of a specific tradition, which is, which is, you know, bound to um, a particular religious authority and, a, and doctrinal um, uh, history. This this other more radical um, way of thinking about faith um, it belongs to this to what I would call weak theology. Weak in the sense that it doesn't have a, it doesn't have an institutional support. It doesn't have a strong uh, confessional uh, architecture. It doesn't have a lot of the very famous and well known. Uh, uh, Doctrines taught by famous and well-known theologians. It's a, it's a sort of, it's more like what uh, Derrida would call a, a specter, you know, kind of a ghost. It's, a, it's a, um, a more haunted face. Now, in that sense, uh, theology, weak theology, is like what I was saying previously about philosophy, namely, it's, it's the right to ask any question. Um, and it takes an interest in religious and theological um, uh, traditions, but a radical interest in them. And it's not just traditional theological, uh, philosophical theology, because you've always had that. You've always had philosophers who ask questions about theology, like, can you prove the existence of God? Well... This is not exactly like that. It's not so much uh, rational, deductive, uh, logical uh, reflection on religion as it is an attempt to sort of get inside religious life and be sensitive to religious life and theological traditions and um, get a sense for what's happening there for the event. And so... Uh, rather than simply calling it a philosophical, rather than calling this weak theology uh, a philosophical theology, which is we always had, I would rather call it a kind of poetics or theopoetics because it attempts it attempts by the resources of phenomenology and hermeneutics and deconstruction and a lot of postmodern techniques to get inside these theological traditions to get a sense of what's going on there and to report them in a way which would make sense to someone even if they're not inside a religious tradition, even if they're not Christians or Jewish or, or, or Muslims, but they would find these, these sorts of things um, provocative and, and informative. And that's why I think you should be studying religion, no matter whether you're religious or not, just the same way that you should study poetry and history. It's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a sort of a basic part of, of who we are. You used a couple words I thought would be good just for you to kind of uh, give a little definition and maybe explain their relationship, because a lot of people hear them in discussions of post-modernity. Like post, what do you, how would you talk about post-modernity, de- deconstruction, and hermeneutics, and the way they you see them relating well um you, you it would take a lot of uh, uh, footwork to straighten all this out but um in in general the the word postmodernity has come to mean uh, sort of anything that's going on 
these days currently means in in the very loosest sense it means sort of current up-to-date contemporary and so it's kind of sort of chronological sense um it also suggests uh a um uh and this maybe this is uh, one of the more important senses of the word it it suggests a, a, a sense of pluralism you know, that there isn't a single one fixed way of doing things or saying things or thinking things. And there isn't a single one fixed way of living. There, there, are, there are many what, what uh, Wittgenstein, the philosopher Wittgenstein, called forms of life. There's mm-hmm. a multiplicity of forms of life. And postmodernists are people who have come to recognize and to respect these differences. So postmodernity is uh, respectful of differences. It affirms multiplicity and plurality. And it's always worried that a thing that we've gotten accustomed to is going to become hegemonic and exclude other possibilities. So it's a kind of radical openness to other ways of thinking and being and, and meaning. Um, I think that's sort of the, the, the general sense that the word has, has taken on. Or originally, it actually was a term in, in architecture, and uh, that, that's another story. <laughs> that, that's where the word came from. It was transferred from architecture to contemporary, to, to a wider cultural phenomenon. There was modernist architecture, which was extremely mathematical and Cartesian and geometric. And then postmodern architecture came along and said, "Well, you don't want to be just like that. You want you don't want to forget uh, all the you don't want to forget the tradition." And so it it, it became a kind of melange which put put together modernist techniques with all kinds of references to the uh, uh, the tradition. So, for example, there's a building in Pittsburgh which is all steel and glass, so very modern, but it is in the contour, the figure of a medieval cathedral. And um, so it's, it's it's got a medieval Gothic look to it, but it's all steel and glass. Now that's postmodern. So so the word postmodern came to mean pluralism, multiplicity, but not being bound by modernist um, mathematical, uh, rigorous, rule bound procedures. Uh, and and. Uh, Descartes became sort of the bad guy in this story because he he said really everything should follow a mathematical model. Well, postmodernists said, no, 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 no. That's only that's only true within a very limited range. There are mul- there's a multiplicity of ways to think and to be um, and to uh, to live. Um, yeah, all the various. Uh, methodologies, if that's what you want, we want to call them, because even that word is very modernist in methodologies um, of postmodernism, are ways of embracing this multiplicity and plurality. So hermeneutics, for example, uh, you see Paul Ricoeur and, and uh, Hans Gerhard Gadamer, the French philosopher, Ricoeur, the German philosopher, Gadamer, are sort of the uh, most important of the uh, philosophers of uh, hermeneutic theory uh, in the 20th century. And they were both saying, look, a text does not have a single fixed meaning. It, 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 has an, it may have a meaning that we can approximate that uh, was its original meaning back in the time it was written and, you, and, and we can we can try to constitute reconstitute that original time and, and learn the original language and learn the original setting and, and that's that's important you don't we don't want to dismiss that but that first meaning or that meaning that, that the text had when it was first written and, and the way it was received by its first audience does not uh, spell the end of that text. That text has a subsequent history. And if the text is any good, if it's not completely time-bound, 
it will have a history of, uh, of uh, interpretation. So a text doesn't have a meaning, the text has a history. And so you say, what does Hamlet mean? Well, the answer to that is the history of Hamlet interpretation, which is a, an evolving, changing thing. And, and that's not um, the result of some kind of weak, uh, or some kind of uh, failure of the text to, have, to make sense. It's a result of the richness of the text and its capacity to have many senses and to change with the, with the, the times and to take on new meanings for new generations. Um, so hermeneutics back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s was um, um, a very dominant way of thinking about uh, texts and the interpretation of texts, the interpretation of traditions and institutions that we, we would now today call postmodern. We didn't use the word postmodern then, but we today we would call that postmodern. And then after that uh, came along deconstruction which um, was an even more radical, you could say, pluralistic theory. There was a say that said it, it held that things are even uh, more radically uh, multiplied and, and pluralized than hermeneutics was allowed because her, hermeneutics was so much focused on the question of meaning. The construction said, well, you know, there's even more than meaning at work in, in text. There's there, there, there's their uh, there, there's rhythm, there's association, there's um, um, the, the te texts are polyphonic in a way that hermeneutics hadn't quite uh, approached. So the construction then tended to displace uh, hermeneutics, and then that's where my own radical hermeneutics came from because it was an attempt to sort of think in between hermeneutics and radical hermeneutics, I mean, in between hermeneutics and deconstruction, and I called that radical hermeneutics. Um, and all the other sort of dominant uh, ways of thinking in contemporary thought, like like feminism. Feminism is belongs to a, a kind of postmodern spectrum because it's saying, uh, look, there's more than one way to think about things than this sort of virile, logocentric way that has, that has characterized uh, white male philosophy. Mm -hmm. So feminism belongs to this, this pluralist. Cultural studies. All these things are ways of recognizing what postmodernity uh, in, in this general sense would, would simply call uh, pluralism. Mm -hmm. Um. Oftentimes, people hear deconstruction as um, a threat, especially like in faith communities or, or even um, in just the interpretation of the Constitution. You think of like when people call it a living document or things like that, People, some people get on edge. Um, uh, in a number of your works, you talk about deconstruction not being um, a, a threat uh, to the giving of meaning or life or um, uh, progress or uh, um, even the presence of or the the felt absence of the divine and things like that. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about misplaced fears in deconstruction. Uh, okay. Um, but probably the first thing to do is to say, well, it is a threat. It does be a threat, and if it's not a threat, if you're not threatened, you're probably a little too secure for your own good. You might say, if you're not threatened, it's it, it dangerous not to be threatened. Mm -hmm. you know? it, it's dangerous if there's nothing dangerous out there for you. If you don't recognize that there are certain dangers, then that's, that's not good either. So there's something salutary in the threat that deconstruction uh, poses, and I, I do think it, it is threatening. It, it threatens uh, authoritarianism. Uh, it threatens the comfort and complacency that we are uh, inclined to drift into. Uh, it threatens uh, our own self-approval. It threatens narcissism. Uh, it, it threatens our own uh, tendency to uh, think we've got it. <laughs> and um, to attach an undue privilege to our own point of view. So, in all those ways, it's very threatening. 
and it explains to us the sense in which uh, none of that is justified. That uh, things are things that there is a, a an uncertainty in things that is extremely important to come to grips with. And if you don't, um, it'll be dangerous. It'll be dangerous for you, and it'll be dangerous for everybody around you because um, of the kind of um, um, militant uh, and imperial attitude that is nurtured by not understanding um, the uncertainty that uh, besets um, so much, a great deal, you know, everything that we that we think. Um, and indeed, uh, that's what postmodernism in general is. It's it's. It's awakening us to the plurality of ways to be, and uh, it, it unsettles us. It's supposed to unsettle us. It's supposed to threaten our, our sense of self-security. And now that's not absent from the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, that, Can you think I've come to bring peace? I've come to bring the sword. Work out your, your salvation in fear and trembling. You know, there should be a very sal salutary sense of of uh, uncertainty and of um, dangers all around. Now, um, the the thing about postmodernity is that it that that's uh, the rap that it generally has, in particular uh, deconstruction. It, the, the, the the word about it is that it's just that, and it's nothing else. That it's simply. Um, a way to uh, unsettle and undermine and as the word itself suggests to somehow or another take things apart and um, that's what's not true it's not it's not simply that it's not even primarily that it's primarily a, a mood of affirmation and so the the one uh, formulation of deconstruction. There's a lot of different ways to think about it and describe it depending on the context because it's not it's not a fixed method so it doesn't have a there's no single formula that gets it. Um, but the the one that I that I like and that I use uh, on most of the time on occasions like this when someone asks asks me to characterize it, uh, is the one that Derrida uses when he describes it as uh, the affirmation of the impossible, or and sometimes I'll say the experience of the impossible, where the the impossible is not just simply a logical contradiction. It's, uh, it doesn't just mean pay and not pay, but the impossible means, well, I'll, t I'll give you another expression that is very, very, very close to it, and that is when St. Paul uses, uh, speaks about uh, a hope against hope. And it's you a know, really, that's, that's a that's a exquisite, perfect, deconstructive formula. Hoping against hope. Because it's, it sounds like a contradiction, but it's not a simple contradiction. If you're sort of hand-fisted about it, you'll say, well, that's a contradiction. You can't hope against hope. You can't have hope and despair at the same time. Um, but if you have a read, then you understand that actually uh, uh, it's a, a very subtle way of explaining what hope really is. Because hope is hope when things, and it gets to be more and more truly hope when things start to get to, and start looking hopeless. Uh -huh. So hope is hope when things are hopeless. Right? Now, on, if you read that in a hand fisted way, that's, contra that's contradiction. But if you have an ear to hear what's going on, that's why I say there is a poetic, certain poetic quality to uh, reading religious texts and certain poetic residents. Um, if you have an ear to hear it, you understand that he's saying that hope really gets to be what it is, and, it's, and we are really called upon to have hope. When things are getting tough, when it looks difficult, when it looks impossible. Now, Dario will, will be is inclined to describe uh, deconstruction as a whole in those terms. It's it's this. 
affirmation of something impossible, this hope in something impossible, this faith in something impossible, this love of something impossible. So, you know, in my uh, schema, I like to take the, the classical theological virtues of faith, hope, and love and say, you know, that's really, that's how, they're sort of the tunes that deconstruction plays. It's, it's, faith is really faith when um, it's almost incredible and we can't believe it. Hope is hope when it's almost hopeless. And then, in some ways, the best of all, love is really love when you're asked to love not someone who loves you back, but someone who hates you. So the, the paradigmatic Christian idea, the idea that, this, that we associate first and foremost with Jesus, with loving your enemies, loving those who don't love you, those loving those who hate you, fits perfectly into this, this schema of the affirmation of the impossible. So I think in all of the sort of critical analyses that deconstruction undertakes and, and as I started out saying, that's that's absolutely basic to the instruction. It is a critique. It's a way to unsettle. It's a way to uh, to question. In all of that critical questioning, interrogatory uh, uh, work, deconstruction is trying to unsettle the familiar and um, uh, comforting ways of, of hearing something in order to get at something more radical, something like the impossible. So the critique of any existing democracy is made in the name of a democracy to come, a democracy that would be belong to the sphere of the impossible. So uh, it's, in the end, a negative word, grammatically, deconstruct, de which, which literally would mean to take something apart and analyze it. Um, and in fact, it has a, uh, I think if you look it up in the o OED, you'll find some early usages of it in the context of grammar. It was a way to uh, parse a sentence uh, and to figure out the parts of speech of each word in the sentence. Um, so grammatically, the word has a negative ring. But philosophically, it has an affirmative ring. It, has, uh, it means some, an affirmation, an affirmation of something that shatters the existing and settled ways of thinking and acting with which we become more or less complacent in order to keep the future open. But that's another way to summarize it. And, you know, in a nutshell, it, that is, it's a way of keeping the future open. But to keep the future open, you have to deconstruct the present. And so what makes people, people are threatened by the fact that it deconstructs the present. Mm -hmm. But what they tend to miss is the promise, the opening of, of, of a future. But deconstruction is a way to give a, a text or an institution anything, whatever it is you're doing, it's a way of giving it a future. And that's what, so now that doesn't get the headlines. What gets the headlines is the critical analysis. And then beyond that, you have a cultural problem. And that is that we live in an Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, so we come from a tradition of um, empiricists and pragmatists. And um, we speak a language that um, in which the, the main philosophical tradition has always been sort of empirical and scientific. Um, and deconstruction belongs to a French tradition, and there's always been a certain suspicion of the continent in uh, England. England was an island, and it kept itself separate from the, from the, uh, the continent. And to this day, you know, it uses pounds and not euros. It doesn't want to be wary of being assimilated into the into the continent. And the French and the German, who at various times appeared to, to the English as just crazy, you know, the, the, the speculations of Hegel in the 19th century appeared just crazy to English, uh, to a lot of English philosophers. And um, 
the speculations of Heidegger in uh, the 20th century appeared crazy to uh, uh, logical empiricists in England. And then in the, and at the end of the 20th century uh, and up to the present, the, the, the flamboyance of French philosophy uh, appeared crazy to the Anglo-Saxon uh, world. Now, in a certain sense, it is, it's flamboyant. It's a, it's a very peculiar way of, of doing things. And so it, it requires a good deal of patience to read these philosophers, and particularly French philosophers, uh, who are, uh, you know, it's been a long time just playing with French words, and you say, "Well, what what good is this? You know, why, what am I going to learn by putting up with this?" Well, you know, that's sort of where I come in. So I try to say, "Well, now look here, here, here's what's happening. Here's what, here's what you're doing. Here's, let me let me let me explain this in a way that will make a certain amount of sense to a, a, a in American English." So you have a stylistic problem there. But beyond the stylistic problem, there, there's a substantive one because there is a serious, intense critique going on in these philosophers. But it is not uh, nihilistic. The, the rap is, it's nihilism. That's, that's sort of a Time Magazine headline, you know. That's, that's, that's just the way of, that's a kind of sensational portrait of these guys. If you read them more carefully, and particularly of all of them, for me, anyway, uh, Derrida, uh, you'll see a different story. But it, it takes a certain amount of time. You, uh, your turn to theology uh, being helped by a person like Derrida seems kind of odd, I guess, to a lot of people, especially in just the general American audience. Um, I was wondering if you could give us some examples of his thought that inspired or led to some of your own uh, return to theological reflection. Yeah. Um, well, remember now, I never quite left theological reflection. I always had, it's always sort of on my horizon. Um, but, um, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, Derrida appears an odd fellow for someone with uh, theological interests. Um, but it was, I think, maybe... Uh, precisely the, my theological ear, insofar as I still have one, mm -hmm. uh, that I picked up, made me pick up on Derrida in a way that's different from other French philosophers like, like Foucault, for example. Um, there was a, Derrida had a resonance for me that, um, Foucault never had. And I think that uh, the resonance is theological. Now, as you say, that sounds strange. It sounds strange to people who work in continental philosophy, every bit as much as people um, in, in theology, both in, in a sense, taking their uh, as a as my uh, aid to, to theological reflection was a strategy calculated to please nobody because it made kind of philosophers nervous, but it also made theologians nervous. <laughs> it made the friends of Derrida, the secular philosophers who used deconstruction nervous, no less than it made the theologians nervous. But um, I feel uh, justified now because there's so much interest in theology and Derrida and and thinking that I was right. Um, now the reason, what, what I picked on, picked up on was the following. When I was, I was working, when I wrote Radical Hermeneutics, when I started to write Radical Hermeneutics, I was pretty much convinced that you know, the way to go was uh, a more straightforward hermeneutics of the sort that um, you find in the tradition from Heidegger's Being in Time to Gadamer and Ricoeur. And I thought Derrida was, uh, what little I knew of him, sounded, sounded crazy to me, too. And so then I thought, well, I'm going to have to look into this more carefully. I'm not, going to, I'm not about to say that in print uh, until I'd looked into it more carefully. And as soon as I did, I realized that was wrong. That was a misimpression that I had picked up, but it was wrong. And uh, what I noticed was this, and it was a, it was a very Kierkegaardian analogy. 
Mary Kierkegaard with the three stages of the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious. Both the aesthetic and the religious are exceptions to the universal. So Kierkegaard described the ethical as the universal. And he had sort of Kant in mind, you know, that um, so acts that the maxims of your actions can be a rule for everyone. So for mm -hmm. Kant, the basic law of ethics was, you know, to put it very simply, suppose everybody did that. You, know, you can't steal because suppose everybody steals. So the basic rule of ethics in Kant is universalizability. In Kierkegaard, sort of focused his three stages around that that notion of universality. So he had the the aesthete, and the aesthete was sort of below the level of universality. He just, uh, you know, he never got, to, he never wanted to get as far as ethics. He he was a dal a dallier. He he flitted from butterflies. He was a butterfly who flitted from flower to flower, never in, never getting involved in universal rules, but just simply enjoying himself from day to day. And dallying with, uh, you know, in the diary of the seducer, he dallies with this young woman to see how much nectar he can draw from that episode, and then he drops her and moves on. You know, mm -hmm. just like he ruins her life, but that's of no interest to him. He's, you know, the, his interest in that episode is over. Um, and so the S C is below the universal, but then. And then, so then you have, you counter the SD with the rule of law. You, you can't be like that. Suppose everybody did that. So then you have the second volume of either or with the ethical and the invoking the rules of universality. But then Kierkegaard trumps that. And he says, actually, there's an exception to the universal, which is higher than the universal, not lower. Mm -hmm. And that's the story. That's the story of Abraham and Isaac. The, the universal is thou shalt not kill, and thou, so thou shalt certainly not kill thy son, um, but the religious is the exception to the universal. Now, when I started reading Derrida more seriously and getting into it uh, more carefully, it suddenly hit me. The exception to the universal that Derrida is talking about is not comparable to the aesthetic in Kierkegaard, but to the to the religious. Mm -hmm. It's not an ethic it's not an exception beneath universality. It's an exception above universality. It's higher than universal, not lower than universal. Mm -hmm. And consequently the critique of Derrida, the rap, you know, the the threat, the the perceived threat of Derrida that simply thinks this is all nihilism. That's based upon a mis misrepresentation or misimpression that this is aestheticism, that it's an aesthetic exception that he has in mind, whereas, in fact, it's a religious one. And um, I made that argument in an article that I wrote back in the 80s called uh, Beyond Aestheticism. And if you go back and look at that little article, that is the core point of departure for virtually everything I have to say about Derrida. This is a religious exception to universality, not an aesthetic one. And then it hit me that it's, um, it, that it's more than just simply a formal analogy. It actually has some real substantive biblical resonance because what is it that Derrida is talking about? What, what is he f focused on? Where is his attention? It's always to the to the other one who is left out, the one who is excluded by the universal, the one who drops out, mm -hmm. the one who is forgotten, excluded, marginalized, and that's a salient motif of uh, the biblical tradition, both uh, Jewish and Christian: the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. Okay, so here is this secular philosopher, an atheist, my any standard reckoning, who has this deeply biblical, religious dimension to him. Now, it's not biblical theology, it's not Christian, or in this case, Jewish theology, in any strong sense, but it is what 
you know, I later on would call a kind of weak theology, a theology which is not intertwined with the dogmatics of a, of a biblical or an ecclesiastical tradition, but one in which the sort of deep uh, events that are going on in that tradition are being reproduced in a different form, in the form of a, of a, uh, uh, a secular, what we would call a secular philosophy, but you know, in, in a way, it undermines the distinction between sacred and secular, or religious and secular, because it's, it is a, it is a, a repetition, a certain repetition of a uh, biblical motif. So, I I began arguing uh, that there is a an important. Um, indeed central biblical or religious motif in Derrida and if you miss it you're going to mistake what's going on and you're going to fall into this trap of uh, writing him off as, as, as a relativist and I started saying that at a time when I didn't have a whole lot of text to back me up I mean, it, was a, it was very much an interpretation um, there, were, there, were, there were certain things that I could call upon but as time went by, uh, I think the case became conclusive because, for one thing, his relationship to another Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, started to become clearer and clearer, and he started to make it clearer. Uh, and then he began, um, somewhere in the late 80s, writing much more explicitly about topics that had a patently religious tonality to them, you know, like the gift and uh, especially forgiveness. And so by the late 80s, he started to say things that confirm more explicitly for me what uh, I had been, what had started that more as a hypothesis or an interpretive schema. And I once met him at a... Uh, a conference in Italy in the 70s, and he was going on about his stuff about undecidability. And I said to him, because it was a small enough group that we, we were able to talk, uh, I said to him, you know, that really sounds like Kierkegaard to me. And he said, you know, but basically, well, yeah, that's where I got it. And that is, when he was talking about undecidability, he was saying, undecidability is the condition of possibility of a true decision, which is pretty much what Kierkegaard would say. When you're, when you're faced with a, a, an either-or, and there isn't a computer program that you can run in order to figure out what the answer is, when you just have to make a decision, that's, that's the conditions of a real decision. So when the decision is almost impossible, you know, when you find yourself tormented by opposing alternatives, well, the more tormenting, the more impossible the decision, the more it's a real decision. Whereas when when it's what we call a no-brainer, it's not much of a decision. It's pretty easy to make. Mm -hmm. But real decisions uh, are the extreme opposite of a no-brainer. And he was sort of explaining all of this at this conference, and I, and I said to him, that really sounds like fear and trembling to me. It really sounds like Kierkegaard. And he says, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's basically where it, it was coming from. And um, I, I don't mean to say that everything that's important about Kierkegaard, about their last family Kierkegaard, but you can see that Kierkegaardian uh, motif there. And that's really, really important to hearing Derrida. Then you find out that Derrida is Jewish, you find out that he's interested in living now, you find out that there is a, a kind of biblical... Um, world uh, behind a lot of what Derrida is saying, which also shows up in his interest in analyzing text. So he's got, he's very rabbinic, you know, he, mm -hmm. like the, the rabbis love to mull over text and come up with original readings of text and find ingenious ways of re rewriting text. And, well, he's like that. So that was... People saw that, you know, there was work back in the 60s and 70s, on, or not the 60s, but the 70s, on Derrida, which uh, showed this uh, rabbinic side to him. But, and that meant, well, he reads texts like a rabbi reads texts. Um, but then, as time went by, 
I said, uh, what, what I argued, what a lot of people began to see was, well, it's not just that. It's not just that he reads texts like a rabbi, but there's actually a, there are substantive biblical motifs here. There's this widow, orphan, and stranger motif that you find in Levinas that's very central to uh, to Derrida. So he at one point used the expression religion without religion, meaning this sort of deep religious uh, event without uh, going along with any particular confessional or dogmatic tradition. And uh, I said, and he was talking about um, Heidegger when he used that expression, Heidegger and some others. Um, not about himself, but I thought, my gosh, that's a perfect way to describe him. It's, it's a kind of religion without religion. It's this sort of religious structure, um, but without uh, the, the doctrinal or the confessional or the ecclesiastical um, um, I don't want to say accoutrements, but but but, but uh, institutionalization. Could you could you use your dichotomy again between faith and belief? Exactly. Yeah. Sure. There's a certain structure of faith in there. I mean, you, you see that with all the the talk of uh, the messianic, mm-hmm. as opposed to the messianisms or the, the notion of the to come. It's a structure of faith that is separable from dogmatic beliefs. He doesn't, uh, on the level of dogmatic beliefs, he's an atheist. Uh But when he describes himself as an atheist, he doesn't say, period, I am an atheist. Je suis, or say moi. He doesn't say that. He says, um, well, I rightly pass for an atheist. And you say to him, well, why why do you say rightly pass? Why don't you just say I am? Well, because, you know, it's not that simple. I mean, there's, a, there's an undermining of the, of the distinction between atheism and theism in deconstruction. I mean, it stands to reason. Whenever you set up an opposition, it will, it, will, it will undermine that opposition and show you how you're making everything too simple by, by creating such an opposition. Um, and he, uh, he says, so, you know, uh, on one, one sense, in one, on one level, I'm an atheist, but there's another sense in which um, the Word of God is working for me in, a, in, a, in an important way. And so, and you can say, well, the level of belief is an atheist. But there's this other deep structure of faith in which it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You're not getting at much. You're not coming up with much when you say, this, this is atheism. Uh-huh. It's, you know, it's, you can say that. It's just true on one level, but you're, you're just missing uh, the rest of what's going on. And and that's a that's a faith belief distinction. In your uh, more recent work in the weakness of God and what would Jesus deconstruct, you start to develop um, theological ideas and reframe central doctrines of the faith. Um, and and I was hoping that you could pick one or two and maybe just uh, play them out. So for people that may not have been putting together all the. Uh, uh, ideas of Derrida, they'll see what kind of uh, theological poetics or imagination um, it can fund. Well, um, the uh, I guess there's two big ones that are being rehearsed in the weakness of God. Um, one is uh, the notion of creation ex nihilo, and the other is um, what I call the poetics of the kingdom. And that's sort of part one of the book and part two of the book, and in, in between part one and part two uh, is um, uh, a kind of methodological interlude in which I talk about some of the things that you've been asking me about, about what, what hermeneutics means, what deconstruction means, and what, how, how do we read theological texts, what sort of method are we we are uh, using. Um, now, let's 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 take the second one first. The the, the, the poetics of the kingdom. Um, there, I try to say, there's a way to read the New Testament which doesn't demand um, that you sign on to any Christian confessional. 
uh, religious tradition. Um, there's something going on there, which is um, um, deeply human in the sense that uh, any 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 person who hears this can come under its spell, can be touched by it, um, and. Um, The New Testament is, uh, uh, in the New Testament we find the poetics of the kingdom, and the poetics of the kingdom challenges, deconstructs, um, unmasks, exposes uh, what we might call the economics of the world, where the world is, in the world, nothing is for free. In the world, you only get what you earn, and you get paid back in kind for everything you do wrong. There is a kind of heartless, relentless logic to the world. The world, the world there's no free lunch in the world. So, when you look at the um, look at the accounting, you do a kind of phenomenology of the world in the New Testament. The, the world is a heartless place. The world is. Jesus came into the world, and the world didn't recognize him because he was of a different world or of another world or in terms of, you know, instead of thinking about that sort of like as in Platonism where there's two worlds, one in space and time and the other one in eternity, I say, well, look, think of this sort of phenomenologically. The, the sayings about the kingdom are an interruption of the world. They, they, they throw the world into confusion and they put the world on the spot and they confront the world with another way to be which confounds the world, which the world is astonished by. It, it's sort of, um, it, it, the, the world has no accounting for this, this way of being which Jesus is, is enacting. He's not just speaking about it, but he's doing it. Um, and that's uh, a paradoxical way to be. It's a, it's a way which greets hatred with love, which greets uh, offense not with retaliation, but with forgiveness, which lays down the sword, um, which uh, is marked by this uh, unworldly interruption of worldly way of, of the worldly way today called forgiveness, and forgiveness is uh, uh, if you think about it, and the more you uh, probe it, uh, astonishing, confounding. Forgiveness becomes the impossible. Mm-hmm. Now, if you look at um. The logic of forgiveness, you, 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 you see this sort of Derridian analysis kick in, and, and you come to suspect that something like that was going on in the teachings of Jesus, because if you think of forgiveness as a logical thing that makes sense, that's what we might call kind of worldly or economic forgiveness, that is where forgiveness is a good exchange. And my example there is when a bank says that a, a debt is forgiven. Well, when a bank says that, what that means is that you've paid the bank off, you've given the bank its money back along with interest, right? And they say the debt is forgiven. Well, when the bank says that your debt is forgiven, that's bank talk. You know, they didn't forgive anything. They got paid back with interest. Now, the classical way of thinking about forgiveness is, is pretty much like that because it lays down four conditions that you have to meet in order to be forgiven. You know, you have to say you're sorry, you have to make amends, you have to promise not to do it anymore, and you, and you have to promise to do penance. But well, after you've done all that, that's like paying your mortgage. Right? I mean, you, 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 are, you deserve forgiveness at that point. But if forgiveness is a gift, then maybe what we have to forgive is not someone who's met all the conditions, but someone who hasn't. And so you, you, you come back to the logic of the impossible and you see forgiveness is forgiveness. It really has teeth in it when you run up against something unforgivable. <laughs>
forgiveness is forgivable and you have to forgive the unforgivable. Now, the logic of the kingdom or the, the, the poetics of the kingdom is like that. It's constantly confounding the logic of the world with these um, uh, kingdom paradoxes. And, and Jesus appears to be very much uh, marked by this kind of paradoxical logic, and it, and it, it confounds the world. And I, I sort of summarize all that by saying, Jesus comes not to teach strength but weakness. And I take up St. Uh, Paul's expression, the weakness of God, which is stronger than the, than the, war, than the strength of the world. Um, and um, then you see, uh, and I think that, that captures very nicely the, 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 the poetics uh, of the kingdom, that, that Jesus greets worldly strength with a kind of divine weakness. He, he, he greets brutality with kindness. And you know, it's like the story of the Grand Inquisitor, when the Grand Inquisitor is going to he arrests Jesus and he's going to have him uh, burnt at the stake the next morning and after a big long um, uh, speech that he delivers at Jesus, Jesus just remains silent and goes up to him and kisses him, gives him a kiss. And the, the Grand Inquisitor is completely disarmed by this. Um, well, that's, that's, that's the, 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 uh, the poetics of the kingdom. Um, it, it responds beautifully, I think, to Derrida's analysis of the affirmation of the impossible, the weakness of God, the impossible. The Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is somebody described it as the most compromised document in the history of the West. You know, who, can, who can abide by the Sermon on the Mount? The Sermon on the Mount is the, is the poetics of the impossible. So there's all that, and that's, that's, that's in the second half of the book. In the first half of the book, before I get that far, I take up the question of creation, and um, because creation always, you know, when you talk about the power of God, you say, well, there's the power of God, the absolute, complete omnipotence of God in um, the theological tradition is most, uh, perfectly exhibited in the doctrine of creation that God created everything out of nothing with a sheer word. He spoke and the whole universe came to be out of nothing. The absolute, total omnipotence. Complete omnipotence. And, you know, that, that way of thinking about God uh, makes me nervous because it lends itself to a notion of sovereignty that translates into uh, other forms of sovereignty, like the sovereignty of nations and the sovereignty of individuals. And I don't, I don't like to think in terms of the sovereignty of uh, any individual person or the sovereignty of any individual nation. You want to think in terms of a, um, a kind of community of... Um, so what I did was go back and look at that uh, theory of... Uh, account of creation from nothing and um, and of course you know when you do look at it very carefully you discover that that's actually a second century theological innovation that nobody before the second century uh, in the Christian era thought uh, held that that you know, everybody held the uh, pre-existence of the uh, elements which is the Genesis story and also and, and that was the, the Jews and the Christians both and then the philosophers held to the theory in uh, Plato uh, and the Timaeus uh, of the uh, the, 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 the very similar story you know that the demiurge formed uh, this indeterminate stuff called Kora uh, using the archetype of the pure forms. So Plato had a story that was basically like the one that was in Genesis, namely that the, the divine author of the universe gave form to matter, or gave order to chaos. Mm -hmm. And that was the common teaching. And then it was as a result of a debate in the second century with the Gnostics that the notion of creating completely out of nothing first gained the upper hand. 
And so you didn't have this, this notion of, of creation out of nothing, and you constantly didn't have the same notion of omnipotence. And then I went back and looked into uh, further into some of the Jewish renderings of Genesis, and you discovered uh, that there was a lot of attention paid to the uh, the original elements. You know, it's it's, it's as if God were, were um, uh, overlooking these sleeping elements, as if they were asleep. They, they were they were lifeless. You know, the waters had no fish. There was water, but there were no fish in the water. There was air, but there were no birds on the air. And there was a, a land surface, but there was no living things walking on it. So he separated the water from the uh, 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 from the land. Uh, he divided things up so that the, the, the waters would be held back by the sky. The land would be cleared. He put... Uh, he put fish in the water, he put living things on the earth, and he put birds in the air. So it was a move, clearly a movement from from non-living elements to life. What, what God did was bring life about and declare it good. And then I came upon a story that uh, uh, one of the rabbinic interpretations of the story, which... Um, emphasized that he, he, he tried this 24 times, and every time he tried it, he failed. And then finally he got it right, and when he got it right, he said, let's hope it works. It was a kind of rabbinic uh, interpretation, Talmudic interpretation, and uh, a joke. And But it was a profound joke, right, because it was trying to say there's a certain contingency in things. I and mean, if you look at the account of of Yahweh in the in, in the Jewish scriptures, he, you know, in the, particularly in Genesis, he he regrets what he did, starts all over again, thinks that all the whole the whole project was a failure, and it's got to be started all over again. So he floods the world out and starts it again. Um, he doesn't know where Adam and Eve are when he's looking for them in the in the garden. And so you have a very different portrait of God, one which uh, admits contingency and revisability and fallibility and uncertainty into the story. Um, so I um, we told the, 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 theory, the story of creation in, in those terms. And then I, I also found myself in dialogue with uh, Catherine Keller, who is uh, someone who brings together uh, biblical scholarship and uh, an interest in postmodernism in Derrida in particular, along with process philosophy. And so uh, I found her uh, work to be uh, a big help in, in the first half of the book. So in both cases, I was trying to um, explain uh, things that, that are held inside confessional religion in a strong sense. Uh, to to re repeat them in a way that makes uh, uh, sense outside conditional limits and uh, which in, is is a kind of enduring truth, you know, that you don't have to be you don't have to be inside these confessional traditions to hear what's being said by these things. Anyone can appreciate them. They they represent a kind of weak theology. Um, and uh, a theology of weakness. Now, this is a theology of forgiveness and nonviolence, which I think is a particularly pertinent uh, lesson to draw from the, our religious traditions these days when we are so much engulfed by, by religious violence. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for uh, talking with us about all this. And... I will make sure if you are just listening on iTunes, just go to the website and I'll have links to a number of Dr. Caputo's books and um, and I'll link to like the Stanford Philosophy Encyclopedia if you haven't heard of a number of the philosophers or concepts he mentioned. That way you can find little uh, quick definitions. Um, I guess as we as we go, I, I wonder what's up next for John Caputo. Well, in, in accordance with deconstruction and Christianity and a lot of other things, the future is unknown, and let's hope it's uh, for the best what's up next. But what I'm working <laughs> on, what I'm working on now is uh, what I'm tentatively calling a theology of the flesh. And 
if you visit my website at Syracuse University and you look at courses under courses, you'll see I'm teaching a religion course uh, this fall called The Theology of the Flesh. And um, I want to go back and continue this work that I started in The Weakness of God, um, and uh, which I, with the subtitle, which was A Theology of the Event. And I want to go back and look at um, the event, which is uh, happening, which takes place in what we call flesh, and to distinguish flesh from body. Our bodies uh, are organic, active organic um, beings in the world, but flesh is a kind of sort of our tender part, our soft spot, uh, the, the site of feeling and vulnerability and pain, but also pleasure. Uh-huh. And, and, and it's interesting, you know, that if you look at the word incarnation, that word is translating, is the, the root word there, carne, caro, carnis, is flesh, not body. So it, in, incorporation would be body, but incarnation is flesh. So in a, a very central way, Christianity is a theology of the flesh. Not exactly of body, but of flesh. And um, I am trying to extend what I said about um, the weakness of God and the theology of the event to a theology of flesh. And then that hooks up with some stuff that's going on now in technology, in uh, information technology, and in the prospect of the technology holds out of more and more and more, uh, not just supplementing the flesh, although that's a good word from Jack Derrida too, and, and worth pondering, um, but even of replacing flesh. And so we have artificial, we have prostheses. You know, we are, we are as technology, medical technology progresses, we are more and more able to replace the weak and fragile, vulnerable flesh of our bodies with um, ceramic replacement parts, you know, mm-hmm. ceramic hips and, and artificial hearts and, and uh, maybe, you know, uh, in, in, in a future that we can't imagine, maybe replacing the body itself, which you'll find uh, certain uh, people who describe themselves as post Humanists uh, imagining. So there's a, there's, a, there's a fellow who says, well, why won't we at some point be able to upload consciousness onto uh, a piece of hardware and then download it into a new robot body and live forever? So um, this question of flesh, which goes all the way back to the, to the heart, of Christianity is also very much at issue in contemporary uh, technologies of the body, mm-hmm. or what are called post-humanism. So I have a little sketch of this course uh, in, on my website, and that is pretty much a sketch of the book that I'm trying to write right now. In fact, as soon as I hang up the phone, I will get back to work on it. Well, thank you for joining us and uh, giving us some of your time. Well, it was my pleasure, and I'm very uh, flattered that you uh, were interested enough to uh, take your time to do this. All right. Well, you have a great day. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye. Bye.